So my name is Lawrence Lessig. I'm a professor of law at Harvard Law School, and I've done a lot of work in the area of culture and the internet. Well, I originally worked um, on the uh, question of the law in cyberspace, um, and then about 10 years ago, uh, I began to become an activist around the questions of intellectual property in cyberspace, because it seemed to be uh, a particular example of how um, interests were radically changing the potential uh, for uh, um, extraordinary opportunity in cyberspace because of a vision of intellectual property that was set in the last hundred years. So we began to do a series of things including litigation that went to the Supreme Court, challenging copyright statutes to building, helping others uh, as well to build um, a nonprofit, a Creative Commons that um, uh, tries to deal with the problem in, in a way, and then flinging myself all across the world giving lectures that try to get people aware of what's at stake and how to fix what's at stake. I don't think we know yet how history is going to look at this period. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a book and then a film called Awakenings, which is the story of these people who contracted a disease that throws them into a kind of coma-like state. And then they take a, they're given this drug, El Dopo, which wakes them up um, from this. And they come back to life. And there's this enormous emotion around the fact that they've been made human again. Um, and then within a couple months, it's clear that the drug is going to wear off and they're going to go back into this coma-like state. Um, and, uh, and one story about what's happening with culture now is very much like that. We're in the middle of this kind of awakened period and people are doing all sorts of amazing things and uh, making films on shoestrings budget and doing all sorts of stuff that 20 years ago would, would have seemed impossible. Um, but you can imagine the regime of control that the law typically represents figuring out how to button this all back down and driving us back into our passive relationship to culture. That's one possible story. On the other hand, the more optimistic story is we've actually entered into a new stage where we expect of each other and of our kids and of our culture um, a much more participating, uh, engaged, critical relationship to everything, including the stuff we listen to and the stuff we read. Um, and that this might just be the beginning of it if we can just get the, reg the legal regime clear so that we're not rendering it illegal from day one, this might be something exciting and productive. Well, copyright laws um, were designed to try to find some trick to monetize an activity that made sense to monetize so that artists could get compensated. And the basic activity that they decided to monetize was the act of publishing, printing. Um, Music is different slightly, but here's the core idea. Like, you're going to engage in the act of printing something. Now we have an event that convinces us that there's a reason to tax you. Because if you're printing, you must be printing to sell. And so if you're selling, then there's some income. And if there's income, then we should get some of it. And that's the way we're going to fund artistic development. Well, when you shift into the digital world, um, making a copy is no longer an exception. It is the norm. It's you can't do anything with content in the digital world without making a copy. So that we go from a world where you only rarely would trigger copyright law in physical space to a world where it's almost impossible not to trigger copyright law in any number of contexts that you might be making use of or taking advantage of content. And so the law all of a sudden regulates in a wider range of contexts than it was ever designed to regulate. And then that forces us to think about, well, what license do I have to be using this material because copyright law says it's subject to control, uh, and so on. So, so the, the architecture of copyright law triggered on copies is harmless in a physical world and destructive in a digital world. And, and that's what drives many of us to say we need to find a different mechanism for triggering this law that, that isn't so destructive. To what extent am I free to build upon the culture around me to remix with it and to share it with others? Um, I don't really care about defending somebody's right to profit from somebody else's work without their benefit. Um, I care about the ability to extend and to um, critique and to do all the creative acts that we've always expected people to be free to do without crossing these cumbersome 
and, and dangerous lines of copyright in order uh, copyright law in order to do it. Um, so the 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 real challenge is to focus the debate um, on the good that this technology produces, and to ask the question: How do we architect a law to take advantage of that good, as opposed to how do we architect the law to stop it? In the short term, we're going to see more restrictive laws and more interesting creativity. And it's not clear yet which choice we're going to make for the future of the culture. Um, again, it could be the awakenings choice that kind of we lock ourselves back down, um, or it could be uh, um, something much more interesting where we actually figure out how to build upon this potential uh, and encourage um, many institutions to participate in that, like education institutions. Um, uh, so I think a lot of it is still open, and that's why right now it's so critical to be um, getting people engaged in the question of deciding what the future is going to look like. I mean, the way the world is right now, schools are afraid to teach kids how to be creative in this remix way because the lawyers for the schools say, well, it's uncertain legal exposure, we shouldn't do that, it's too expensive to defend if we got sued, so let's not do that. So we can't even educate our kids in the proper ways to be creating here in, in um, and, and that, and that, you know, of course, makes no sense at all. So, so we got to move into a place where we can at least be entitled to take advantage of the technology, um, the creative potential of the technology, and then to see how far we can get with convincing our kids to do it. I write, um, and I know the difference between the experience of writing and the experience of just reading. Um, I, I love to do both, but. It would be an incomplete life if it were just reading. Um, and maybe it's just the way my head works, but I feel like I don't understand the world until I can write it. And writing is how I come to navigate what I think. Uh, and if that's the way my kids are, then I want my kids, too, to have that freedom and experience and encouragement to engage in that. And they won't be writing with a, you know, a computer typing out books. They might be writing with a video camera or writing with um, you know, a music a machine that makes it easy to compose and, and to produce uh, that kind of music. Well, I don't care what's the mode of creativity, but I do care that they have the experience of creating, um, which I think is an essential human experience. Well, if you look at the creators, it's bright times. All sorts of extraordinary new kinds of creativity happening. Uh, um, but it's hard to read the storm clouds. Uh, it's hard to see which direction the wind is blowing. Um, and there's a way in which this develops to stifle a bunch of the benefit from this creativity. But I don't think anybody can say right now which way it's going. We have to accept a world where we don't actually have the right to control how culture mixes together, um, uh, except in very narrow ways that are necessary to produce the incentives to produce great culture. Um, uh, so I just would urge, and I do urge, um, uh, uh, creators in this context just relax. Uh, you know, it's not uh, it's not the uh, end of the world if your work gets used in ways that you don't intend. In fact, quite often, your work being used in ways that you don't intend is an enormously inspiring twist on the work. So I want the world where my kids can have access to an enormous range of culture for the purpose of remaking it, for the purpose of adding it to their own view of the world, to the purpose of sharing what they've created with others. Um, and it's only a very particular line of development that'll get us there, and not actually the likely line of development. The more likely line of development finally gets the commercial sector to lock on to a model of control that gets us partly there, or gets us in the direction of there, but not quite to that place. So there's a lot to debate and to understand about which way we allow this to develop. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's why I think it's a crucial issue still to be fighting about right now. I want my kids to be creators, not consumers. Um, and I want the regime, the legal regime, to encourage and celebrate that, not punish them and call them criminals.